What's up, witches? I'm back with kind of a sequel to my video on elves and Alfar. Today, we will be talking all about dwarves, dvergar, and svart Alfar. So let's get into it. So for the first part of this video, what I wanted to do is just briefly go over what we know about dwarves as mentioned specifically in Norse mythology and in particular in the Eddas. On the creation of dwarves, if we turn to the Prose Edda in Gilfaginning, it states that the dwarves or Dvergar are the first beings to emerge on the newly formed earth of Midgard, which was made of the Jotun Emir's flesh. And so Snorri says, Next the gods took their places on their thrones, remembered where the dwarves had come to life in the soil under the earth like maggots in flesh. The dwarves emerged first, finding life in Ymir's flesh. They were as maggots at that time, but by a decision of the gods, they acquired human understanding and assumed the likeness of men living in the earth and rocks. In Snorri's version, much like the gods' creation of mankind, in this interpretation, the Dvergar existed, as in, like, they came into existence on their own, but much like the pieces of driftwood, Ask and Embla, they were more shapeless, formless beings at this time, with no knowledge of time or mortality or fate and things like that. No consciousness until they were gifted it by the gods, as in the Aesir. If we look at the poetic Edda in Voluspa, it says, Then sought the gods their assembly seats, the holy ones, and council held to find who should raise the race of dwarves out of Bremir's blood and the bones of Blaine. There was Motsugnir, the mightiest made of all the dwarves, and Durin next. Many a likeness of men they made, the dwarves in the earth, as Durin said. And then we go on to get the very long list of names of the dwarves, some of which will sound familiar to any readers of Tolkien. So outside of this description in the kind of Norse creation myth, we primarily see dwarves appearing in Norse mythology as the craftsmen of the gods. So we see the dwarves appearing in the Prose Edda in the Skald Skaparmal, in the story of how Thor's wife Sif came to have hair of literal gold. It was forged by the dwarves, the sons of Ivaldi, as part of a bet after Loki cut off her hair as a prank. Along with this item, the dwarves also create many other powerful magical tools that were given as gifts to the gods. We see here the creation of Skithblathnir, Freyr's magic boat, which can fold up and fit into his pocket, and also Gungnir, Odin's magic spear, which can pierce anything and won't miss its target once it's thrown. In this story, Loki also gets a rival clan of dwarves involved to create even more magic items as part of the bet which leads to the creation of Gullenbursti, Freyr's golden bristled boar, whose coat and eyes shine brightly even in the darkest realms. We also see the creation of Draupnir, Odin's enchanted arm ring, which will drip more like it every nine nights. And, most famously, Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, which would never break whatever he struck it with, and would always return to his hand when thrown. Meow, meow. What's meow, meow? It's also the dwarves to whom the Aesir turned to create the binding that's used to hold Fenrir. So here, if you watched my video on the Althar, where I kind of compared them to these beings in Vedic myth known as the Rebus, 
They were semi-divine craftsmen who elevated themselves and kind of elevated their standing by their remarkable works, specifically the things that they created for the gods. And so in my mind, the dwarves or dvergar fulfill a very similar similar role in Norse mythology by being these not necessarily divine beings themselves, but elevating themselves to a renowned or special or maybe even semi-divine status by being able to create and craft all of these magical items that not even the gods could make. Above all, the dvergar appear in these stories as the greatest of smiths, while in Norse myth, we don't really see a lot of specific mentions of a deity related to smithcraft, we can look nearby to the Finnish epic, the Kalevala, to see smithcraft as a means of shaping the world, bringing thought and ideas into reality, and in doing so, the Dvergar kind of have a power over the earth itself to shape and transform the metals within, which is kind of a, a magical transformative art in and of itself, and thereby spread the renown of the dwarves from the other world, throughout Midgard, and even up into the realms of the gods. So next I'm going to go a little bit into what some of the differences are between dwarves versus Dvergar versus Svartalfar. Because in Snorri's account of the binding of Fenrir, we see the Dvergar referred to as dwelling in Svartalfheim, which Snorri says is the realm of the Black Elves. So are they the same? Snorri only distinguishes in Gilfaginning between the Light Elves, which are called Ljoselfar, and the Svartalfar, saying that the Ljoselfar are bright and fair to look upon, while the Svartalfar are darker than pitch. If we look to Gunderson's book, Elves, Whites, and Trolls, he divides them further into Dok Alfar or Dark Alfar, divides those specifically from Svart Alfar by theorizing that the Dark Alfar or Dark Elf may actually refer more specifically to the ancestral Alfar in the Norse sense, the burial mound dwelling Alfar, who are called Dark Alfar because since they live under the ground, they less tolerate the daylight and live under the hill. He groups the Svartalfar in with the Dvergar as being the master smiths living deep within the mountains and the stones. And in another paper that I managed to find, going over the linguistics of the term Alfar and its specific uses, it argues that the Dvergar are rather not a type of Alfar because by using both their traits in, as shown in this myth and the linguistic references to both Alfar and Dvergar in the Norse texts, they group Alfar more closely with the Aesir and the gods and the Dvergar more closely in alignment and demeanor with the Jotnar. And perhaps this isn't entirely out of left field because the Dvergar were born of a Jotun's flesh. They sprang up on their own in Ymir's body. And in addition to this, we do see them being opposed to the Aesir, or just rather not necessarily on the friendliest of terms with the Aesir, almost as often as we see their help being sought by the Aesir in the myths. So I thought that was an interesting argument for placing in, in, in terms of kind of like D&D &D alignment, placing Alfar more closely to the gods and the Dvergar and Svartalfar as being more closely aligned with the Jotun. And interestingly enough, Gunderson also does acknowledge the use of the word Alf or Alfar in the Eddas, pointing linguistically as argued that Alfar might have been viewed as a relatively similar or interchangeable term with the word for Os or God as being just a broad term for a spiritual or otherworldly being. But if we look closer at the at the etymology of dwarf or dvergar, it could possibly be traced back to the Proto-Indo-European word duer, which means damage, or dvaras, 
which seems akin to the word deva as in a demonic or chaotic being. It could also stem from the, the word dreo, which means dream or deception. And as I said, we do see these dwarves behaving in often a more unfriendly or Jotun-like manner, especially in the story of Kvasir, where two dwarves actually kill the being Kvasir and then turn his blood into a magic elixir. And this also made me think of dwarf and being tied to this word dvaras, sounding like the word deva, which does refer to the less friendly, more chaotic spirits and beings in the world. Another interesting thing I wanted to point out is from the book Teutonic Myth and Legend, wherein it says during the Norse creation myth that over the dwarves, the gods set Moldsognir, who is Mimir, to be king. In the mounds of the earth dwell one tribe of these earth black elves, which could be the dark elves, within the rocks another, Svart elves, and a third have their home inside high precipitous mountains, which sounds more akin to the Tolkien version of the dwarves. So I just thought that was interesting that in this version of the Norse creation myth, um, it does break it down more specifically, like what the types of dwarves are and where they live. And in addition, also theorizes and proposes that this being Moltsognir is actually Mimir. Because when you look up the meaning of Moltsognir, it means something like he who drinks in might. And Mimir not only is among the oldest beings on Midgard, presiding over the waters or mead of the Well of Memory, this also is a place which lies deep under the earth. So perhaps with Mimir being a being who drinks in might and drinks of this Well of Memory, and living deep under the earth, as many of the Dvergar do, um, that might be why Kenzie says here that Mothsugnir is Mimir, and because he was so old and knowledgeable and also just in close proximity to the home of the dwarves, perhaps that's why he was chosen to kind of oversee them and keep an eye on them. Now, like trolls, we do see stories where dwarves are turned to stone by the sun, as seen in Alvismal. However, it's theorized that they can travel above ground during the day in the forms of animals. In the Ring Cycle, or Volksung Saga, we see dwarves who can shapeshift into fish, otter, and even a worm or a dragon. And it's theorized by Gunderson that the Dvergar may even be able to turn into stags and that they may be the four stags named living at the base of Yggdrasil because they have the same names as the Dvergar listed in Voluspa. We also see that four dwarves are set at the four corners of Midgard to support the sky on their backs. It's also theorized that, much akin to these ancestral mound alfar, Svartalves and Noergar, like the Dock Alfar, may also be closely related to death. Many dwarf names relate to concepts of death, and it's theorized that the Svartalves, with their dark complexion, may resemble that of a dead and bloated corpse. Other sagas describe dwarves as being ghostly pale, which may be because they can't abide the sunlight, and may further confuse them with the Mound Alfar, who have their white appearance from also dwelling below ground. I also thought it was interesting and wanted to kind of point out here a theory that because Snorri's Light Elves don't really appear in name anywhere else in the Norse myths, um, that those might be more of a Christian insert on his part because Snorri really wanted to kind of line up the Christian worldview with the Norse when writing these things down. And so he might have inserted light elves as kind of a comparison or analogy to the angels. 
But we see that the dwar dwarves or dvergar also much like Aten or Jotun dwell in mountains and stones, caves, and caves can be seen as a portal to the other world. And so by dwelling underground in these places, it's theorized that the dwarves could almost act as a guardian or just kind of a point of defense, guarding the stone doors between the realms of life and death. And also with their powers of craftsmanship and magic and being able to transform things via the art of smithcraft, they do seem to be those that can manifest these two sides of reality by being both able to unmake things and make them anew. And like I said, the etymology of Dvara also does tie back to the Vedic myth of the Asuras versus the Devas. The only difference between a Seer and Alfar versus a Dvergar or a Jotun may just be how truthful they are. In addition to bearing a resemblance to the devas as well as the Vedic ribus, there's another possible connection between these master craftsmen and the Germanic dwarves. And this is where I really started to go down a rabbit hole with my research on Dvergar. In Tacitus's Germania, the Germanic tribes are stated as believing they are all descendants of a being called Twisto. This bears a resemblance to a Vedic god who is also the craftsman or smith of the gods called Tvashter. Much like de Vergar, Foster created the tools and weapons of the gods, and in fact, the Ribus were his apprentices. Foster created Indra's lightning bolt, which is very similar to Thor's hammer, and the iron axe of Brihaspati, who is Agni, the fire god, as well as creating a cup to hold the divine elixir of life called Soma, which, like Edom's golden apples, rejuvenates and replenishes the gods, and may also be a reference to the sun and moon. So Tvashtir not only taught the Rebus, who were related to elves and dwarves in my opinion, everything that they know, he also created many magical weapons and tools, much like the Devergar did for the Aesir. Furthermore, Tvashtir is also called the creator of forms, the crafter of living beings, and is considered, therefore, as an ancestor or father to all humans, much like this being Twisto is considered an ancestor to all of the Germanic tribes. An interesting argument is made in this scholarly article that I found, which argues that some translations of the Norse creation myth could imply that not only did the Dvergar spring forth on Midgard on their own, as in they were not created by the gods or any other beings, but that it was they who first created man-like forms, not only for themselves, but perhaps for the first humans, Ask and Embla, as well. If one would have to choose a being most closely tied to the element of Earth, it would definitely be the Dvergar. You know, they were born of it, and they live in it. You merely adopted the dark. I was born in it, molded by it. Similarly, we do see in the Christian story that mankind was molded out of clay. And so if we see this very early pr primitive belief in these beings called dwarves, Dok Alfar or Svart Alfar as beginning akin to the Alfar, as in an inc incorporeal, otherworldly being that's neither a god nor a Jotun. And perhaps the Eddas could be interpreted to show that these Dwergar were such gifted craftsmen, they were able to create bodily forms or manlikun, man-likenesses, for first themselves and then humans at the behest of the gods. Because in the Codex Regius Voluspa, it's argued that the active voice form of the word gerdu, made or created, is used. 
and dwarves in this version are not described as having been created or having been emerged as human-like themselves, but are instead told to have created Manlikun. So in this version, you could translate that passage that I quoted at the, at the beginning of this video as saying, Then gathered together the gods for counsel and held converse. Who the deep-dwelling dwarves were to make of Bremir's blood and Blaine's bones. Moltsogni arose, mightiest of the ruler of the kin of dwarves. Durin next molded many manlike bodies, the dwarves under the earth, as Durin bade them. So Moltsognir and Durin here are the perhaps the first original dwarves who sprang from the flesh of Ymir on their own and then were either given a higher status or higher consciousness by the gods or they then went on to create many other dwarves after their own likeness. So this could be the only way that dwarves are able to reproduce and why in the myths we never see any female dwarves. So the theory is that after these dwarves came into being on their own and they made these man-like or corporeal forms for themselves, that either the gods found two of these unfinished man-likenesses laying around and chose to use them to create the first men by endowing them with their own gifts such as breath, consciousness, fate, and a fine physical form, or that the gods saw the work of the Devergar and were so impressed by what they had managed to do that they then commissioned them to make other man-like forms that they could take and use to create mankind. And you might be asking yourselves, but I thought Ask and Embla were made of wood. You have to keep in mind when reading these stories that Norse mythology in particular treats very heavily in kennings and metaphors. And so it's not just that the first humans were literally made out of pieces of wood. It's more like when the dwarves are described as being like maggots. He's not saying that like the dwarves were maggots. It's saying that they were like magnet maggots living in flesh in the way that they burrow and tunnel beneath the earth. And so similarly, the first humans weren't literally pieces of wood. They're just described as being like driftwood. Driftwood floats aimlessly from one place to another. It floats throughout life without any knowledge of itself or its purpose or its meaning or where it's been or where it's going. And that's kind of how the first men were, much like the dwarves. They were just kind of there existing without knowledge, consciousness, or purpose until the gods came and gifted us with those things. And so, in conclusion, it's very hard, even within the Norse texts, to sometimes distinguish the differences between a Svartalfar versus a Devergar, and it does seem that, as far as those two beings are concerned, they may be referring to the same type of being. But it's interesting that Gundarsson goes a step further in separating out Dokalfar as being perhaps the Alfar that we most commonly see referred to in the, the Norse side of things, being these ancestral mound elves, whereas just Alfar on their own are more akin to a land white or what we may think of when we think of the more traditional elf as being like the Irish she, but that they are very distinct beings. And I thought it was interesting that they argue that Alfar are a distinct class, more closely aligned, being a little bit more perhaps friendly or on friendlier terms with other beings and humans, whereas the Devergar, it could be argued, may be more closely aligned with the Jotun even if the gods do occasionally go seek out their help, much like they do the Jotun. So I'm just going to leave you with that interesting little tidbit and rabbit hole that I went down and let me know your thoughts. Do you think that it's possible that the dwarves had a hand in crafting the first man and woman alongside the gods? Let me know in the comments down below. And until next time, stay classy, pagans.